Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship. We ask you to stand up and join us as we bring praise to the Lord. This song is our invocation, inviting the Spirit, inviting Christ and the Holy Spirit to be with us and dwell among us. Rise 
the lost sheep. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbling, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so
Bible tells us in Romans 1, 8 through 11, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. our Savior. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name Judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever seated high. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son.
worship. Everyone, you may be seated. Friends, it is my great pleasure to share with you that Paul Ogle has been invited to serve as our next interim associate pastor. And so now he leaves his post as one of our guitarists to join me right up in front right here. This man has become a dear friend already in just a short time. I trust him, and I know you trust him as well. And so I believe the Holy Spirit is inviting him to come and join us again in this very important mission. It starts off part-time, though, and it'll have a focus, a main focus, on ministry care. Now, that's more than just caring for you, dear folks. It's caring for you so much that he equips you and trains you so you can learn to care for each other. He will also be sharing in discipleship teaching as well as in preaching. So would you please join me in celebrating Paul being our next interim associate pastor by reaching out your hands right now in the commissioning of Paul. And let us pray. Father God, by your power, we bless and we speak peace over your servant Paul and his willingness to pastorally empower our collective ministry at CLC. So all may believe you and then respond in faith by assisting others to believe you as well through all the thick and thin circumstances of life. Lord God, give Paul and his dear wife Angelita your grace, your courage, and your perseverance. Let them hear and receive your covenant pledge to them today so they can walk by faith right over the top of fear as they serve your gospel. And with that, all God's people say, amen. amen and amen for what God is doing in our congregation. Let's lift up our applause and our praise. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Blessings. Would you please turn your attention to the screen again as we believe God. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Amen. Once again, a God morning to everybody. Yes, thank you. My name is Dan Kleitz, getting to serve as your senior pastor here at Christ Lutheran Church. As our opening worship song strongly suggested, I want to invite you now to please rise in the Spirit of the Lord to your feet. Let's take a stand, shall we? A stand of faith. Now, with that in mind, please take your right hand, for those of you, this, this one here, right, and place it right over your heart. Can you feel your heart beating this morning? Can I? Yeah? Good, we're off to a good start already, right? Now, as Americans, we strike this pose. We stand at our feet, we put our hands over our heart, and then we do something together. We pledge allegiance to what? The flag of the United States of America. And by the way, if you're Canadian, this is for my dear Canadian friends as well. Keep your hands on your hearts. Let's take this exercise up a level, to the level of kingdom culture. That is, believers that Jesus is who he says he is. Are you still feeling that beating heart inside your chest? Huh? Let me know, because otherwise I'm going to be concerned. Yes? Yeah? That's the pulse of God. It's a beating pledge of his allegiance for you, for you, for you. It's the unrelenting, reckless love of God that will go over any mountain for you, given to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is God's pledge sign of life for you on this planet. And more than just my brain is functioning and I'm breathing, but a life in God, a life in Christ, a life with hope and purpose. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. Yeah. Today, perhaps like many of you, I am mourning for our nation. It was not only a very difficult week, but it's been a really rough two months since the election, let alone the last year with all the chaos in the streets and the politicians and the media. And now with the new incoming government in collaboration with our media, I do believe they've been inspired by the, a demonic spirit. 
I'm not saying they're the devil. I'm saying they have been inspired by a dark, dark demonic spirit bent on revenge, bent on the kind of power that doesn't empower people up but pushes people down. And because of that, I believe, and I think you might know this too, that we can expect even more contempt, more angst, a more of a ramped up attacks on free speech. And by free speech, I even mean me being able to stand up here today and say, I believe in God the Father. And you to be able to sing back, and Jesus Christ, his only son, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. That might get curtailed. Or how about this, a ramping up of an attack on the body of Christ. A continued attack on Jesus and who he is. Yes, he is Lord and Savior. And those of us who say we believe that he is more powerful than any kind of government. So today is part two of our six-part message series on what we are calling believing God. It's not just believing in God. That's good too. But it's even more so. I believe God. I mean, the devil believes in God, so big deal if you say I believe in God. But do you believe God? When things are really, really rough and darkness seems to be winning the day, can you stand and pledge your allegiance to God knowing full well that he's got your back? You're that lost of the 99. He's going after you. You do not need to be afraid. And so the word that I share this morning is crucial as we enter into a battle. Friends, four months ago when I started at this church, I said, we are in a battle. And I kind of wondered if anyone even believed me. But we're not in a battle of flesh and blood. We're not in a battle against people. That's fools do that. We're not in a battle of swords and bullets or even words. Man's words. But we're going to battle with God's words. We're going to be battling in the spirit realm. We're going to be battling with light that always wins over darkness. You see, believing God means you not only believe in Him factually or historically or intellectually or even religiously. Yeah, I come to church, don't I? But you trust Him relationally. To believe God means you are surrendering your own control, trusting God in His perspective which is through his word, which is what Pastor Paul Ogle shared last week as we kicked off this message series. Believing God means we trust God in his big picture perspective, by his pledges, through all of our problems, by his wonderful promises, and for his provisions so that we can be more productive in what it means to live out a life in Christ. And so today, our word focus centers on another P word, pledges declared. Say that with me. Pledges declared. Yeah. Please turn your attention to the screen, and you're going to see uh, a review of the difference between a covenant and a contract. Now, I know you've perhaps talked about this before, but a contract is an agreement between one or more parties. If one agreeing party does something in violation of that contract, the contract is then considered broken and becomes null and void. Basically, a contract means I'll hold up my end of this deal so long as you hold up your end. Here's a boil it down, really simple way of talking about contract. It has nothing to do with signing a piece of paper. Let's just say that I walk into a store because I want to buy a new shirt. I only have $30 on me, so I can only buy a shirt that's $30 or less. And lo and behold, I do find one, and I like it, and I have $30, and it's $29. So I bring it to the clerk, I lay down both my money and the shirt. It's a contract, more than just an exchange, because there's an understanding that I will give you my money, and then I'll be allowed to walk out with the shirt. If I say I'm not giving you the money, but I want the shirt, that's breaking the contract, the agreement, and if that's the case, I'll be meeting up with a police officer in the parking lot. Likewise, if I go and I lay down my money, they take my money, but they also take my shirt, I can go and uh, report this person to the authorities because the contract, the agreement of I give you this and you give me that has been broken. Now, that's a really, really simple way of looking at contracts. No signatures. No paperwork. Oops, wait a minute. Forgot about the credit card part. There's a contract. Tried not paying that. A covenant. A covenant is when all parties agree to the deal, regardless of whether one party keeps its part of the agreement or not. So if one party 
violates the covenant, the other party can choose to still continue to move on with the agreement. Now go to the screen again here, and here's an example. When the founding fathers of the United States signed the Declaration of Independence in 1776, the concluding sentence of the document read like this. And the support of this declaration with the firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. In other words, we invite God to be a part of this covenant because if he is not, it won't work. We mutually pledge, we pledge to each other our lives, our futures, and our sacred honor. Back when there used to be something called sacred honor. To the signers of the Declaration of Independence, it didn't matter if one of them were to maybe lose their mind, get afraid, and jump over to the other side, back to the British, or if one of them would be killed in battle, they were still committed to their course of action. And even if it cost them their lives, they were committed. That, my friends, is a covenant pledge. The Declaration of Independence is a covenant pledge declared. While the Bible is the Christian's declaration of dependence upon the, the living Word of God. So, if that's the case, does that make the Bible a contract of God with us? Or is God making a covenant with us through Scripture? Now remember the definitions. A contract stops when one party breaks it, violating the agreement. Well, the covenant continues on by at least one party, even if the other one strays away. So again, is God's word a contract or a covenant pledge? Covenant. covenant. It's God's ongoing pledge to you, for you, for you, for you, like a beating heart. It doesn't stop. It doesn't stop because it's based upon God and not us. You and I break the covenant all the time. All the time. Oh Lord, I, I'm worshiping you. I'm giving to you. I, I'm going to open up my, my prayer life or my Bible and then, you know, the next thing happens. You know, I got to ski or I got to do this or I'm really busy. You know, something. We are conditional. We are broken. We are sinners. We are disobedient. And we break our end of the deal. But God always always keeps his end. And that's why the Bible is a declaration of our dependence upon God. We need his stability. He is our rock. He is our fortress. When we go off, wandering off like that one lost sheep, we know that God continues to stay firm for us, for us, for us, for us. Speaking of such power, Let's go to our Bibles right now. This is the covenant we made with each other. It's not a contract, a covenant that we would bring our Bibles to worship on Sundays, no matter your age or stage, so that we can every, every Sunday make a declaration of some sort. So here we go. You know the drill. Let's raise up our Bibles and repeat after me. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. And by His allegiance to me, I am empowered by faith to pledge my allegiance back to God. Amen. Great declaration, everybody. Let's go to our Bibles now and Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then Acts, Romans. And then find your place in Romans chapter 8. While you're doing that, how about a little trivia? Do you guys know that Joanne and I were married in the Big Apple in New York? You guys know that? Well, that's because it's not true. <laughs> it's close. We actually got married in what's called the Little Apple Seed, a village in Minnesota called New York Mills. Now, tiny little town. But in that tiny little town, Joanne and I made a really big pledge to each other, to have and to hold each other. We, we swore to each other. We, we pledged to each other to be husband and wife through richer or for poorer, with some emphasis on the latter, through sickness and in health, until death do us part. And by the grace of God, we're praying that death 
part doesn't come for at least another 35 years. We've been married 35, so let's double down. Let's go for 70, right? That'd be great. But someday, someday, it will happen. And it is death. And when it does, our declared pledge to each other will be over. That's because according to the world, our marriage contract, and if anyone says, well, it's not a contract, just try getting divorced and going to the court once and see how that goes. Huh? It's a contract in the ways of the world. God makes a covenant, but we make a contract with each other. That's because the first one who dies in a marriage contract breaks the agreement. Why? Because technically, you cannot have a worldly relationship with someone who is dead. Death ends contracts. It separates us. That's why death is such bad news. But the good news for believers is that when God makes his pledge to have and to hold you through richer or through poorer, in sickness and in health, he is not creating a contract. Instead, God is creating a covenant, a covenant of, of his promised presence with us, with us, with us, with us for all eternity. Death is a contract buster. But according to God's word, death is not a covenant breaker because death cannot separate us from the love of God. Now, how do I know that? How can I boast like that? How can I speak so arrogantly about it? The Bible says so. Romans chapter 8, would you please join me on verse 38. Romans 8, 38. I love this first line right away. Right away, Paul is saying, I'm believing God. I'm believing God. He says, for I am sure that neither death, huh? but death does separate things on this planet, nor life, because sometimes things of life separate us, right? Nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, political or otherwise, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to what? Separate us from the love of God, which is ours in Christ Jesus by what he's done for us at the cross and for what he's done for us in his resurrection. Whew, huh? Let's go now to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. When you and I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, we are making a promise. We are promising to be faithful citizens. <laughs> so let me ask, do we always keep those promises? Have you not been watching the news? Right? No, we don't, because why? We are sinful. We are conditional. We pledge allegiance to something so long as it works for us. Hey, I'm all on board with you so long as I feel I like it or I think that I like it. It's based upon how we feel and how we think. But when God makes a pledge, it is a promise that is unconditional. Sure, it's still based upon how God feels and thinks, but God's feelings and his thoughts never waver. In other words, there's nothing that you can ever do to make God love you more. Likewise, there's nothing you can ever do to make God love you any less. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Romans 5, 8. Circle this if it's in your own Bible. But God shows us, He demonstrates His love for us. And while that we were still sinners... We are still disobedient. We still ran away from him. We still forgot about him. We ignored him. You name it. Christ still died for us. He still goes to the cross. Why? Because unless God makes the first move, we cannot possibly turn back to God. Hear that? God makes the first move so that we can respond back to God. That, my friends, is a covenant. So what shall our response be to this covenant? Would you please go to John chapter 13? We're going to be in John for the rest of the morning, so we won't be jumping around too much. John chapter 13. While you are doing that, I want to introduce my dear friend, Mark Schmidt, to join me up in front. Mark and I first met four months ago on one of my very first Tuesday mornings here at Christ Lutheran Church as I helped kind of lead the discussion in one of our Tuesday morning men's Bible and breakfast groups. Guys, it's really fun. Can I get an amen from the guys that come there? Oh, there we got a couple. And so he and I met there for the first time. And, uh, and 
Paul, go ahead, have a seat, my friend. Paul says to me, hey, do you ski? And I said, no, I, I don't ski. And then, and then Mark says, well, then what the hell did you move here for? <laughs> and I, without even blinking an eye, said, Mark, I moved here to keep you from going to hell. Mm. <laughs> and we've been a friends ever since. What's moved me about Mark is that at one point when I said we're going to be sharing up in front our testimonies, he boldly said, that will never be me. That's true. Just tell God what you're going to do, right? Yeah. yeah. But you told me a story one time that moved my heart. You were kind of what, what we'd say a lackluster believer at best, but then a young man who was facing a crisis in his life, yet full of faith, spoke into you, and that changed your life. True. Yeah. True. As a young man, I went to church, you know, every Sunday, and about turned uh, about 12, I was you know, baptized into the church, and then, as a lot of people do, I kind of drifted away from the church, found other things to do on Saturday and Sundays, and uh, anyway, about 40 years ago, I met my lovely wife, Shirley, and she had three children, Cindy is my stepdaughter that I'd go to church with every Sunday, and two sons, Jerry and Brian. Well, we got married, and about less than a year later, Jerry got meningitis and died within eight hours of the time he contracted it. So, you know, life went on. I went to church on Christmas and Easter and thought I was doing okay. Well, Brian, about 17 years ago, got came down with uh, cancer, lung cancer, and it wasn't a fast go at it, and he had ended up with a little girl, and about, oh, she was about uh, eight months old, and I went down there, because Shirley had been down there for two months, you know, helping take care of the little kid, and, and, uh, and you know, helping with Brian and taking care of him. And I went down to see him, and he had probably a couple weeks left to live. And he talked to me one day, and he said, you know, I would like to see you and Shirley go to church every Sunday and, you know, get back into it. And I thought to myself, here he's got a full plate, he's dying, he's got an eight-month-old kid that he's not going to get to even see walk. And that touched me to the point that, I've been going to church every Sunday that I can since then. And Bible, and I'm starting to get into the Bible study. I've been into it a couple of years. A lot of catching up to do. Here's the beautiful part. A believer, even on his deathbed, believed God's promises for him. And he wanted to make sure that he could rub off diatribo upon Mark. And he has. Right? Yep. Mark, thank you for sharing that. For someone who was never going to ever talk up in front, that was beautiful. Thank you. All right, friends, let's go to, uh, well, have you noticed this sign up here, this little poster? Can you see it okay? It says, he died for me. I live for him. It's been hanging in my office for 25 years. Every single day, I take a moment to look up there and read it out loud. I'm actually pledging God's pledge to me, so I can hear it. Dan, remember this. Jesus died for you so that you can live for him. So let's do that together. Let's make a declaration as if we believe that's true. Say, Jesus died for me. I live for you. Jesus died for me. I live for him. Yeah, let's open up our Bibles to John chapter 13, 36. John 13, 36. Here's the setup. The cross is looming near. Jesus has just a few hours left on planet Earth. He's meeting with his disciples. He's speaking about his impending death at that torturous cross. Then in John chapter 13, verse 36, Simon Peter said to Jesus, Well, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. Now, I'm wondering, is he talking about the cross? Peter, you can't go to the cross. Or is he talking about heaven? 
Well, the thing is, Jesus has to go to the cross. Peter can't conquer sin and death. Only Jesus can. And so when Jesus can, now he opens up the door for heaven. But Peter says to him, well, Lord, why can't I, I follow you right now? Why can't I follow you right now? Peter actually thinks he's free to make that choice. I mean, we've made pledges like that too, haven't we, to God? But he's still in bondage to himself. Why can't I do that right now on my own power is what he's really saying. But friends, we know that Jesus, and only Jesus, is the way to the Father. Not by Peter's good intentions. Not by our good intentions. But Peter ramps it up just a little bit more. He says, I will lay down my life for you. Now that's a beautiful thing. I'm sure Jesus was quite touched by it. I will lay down my life for you. Now is that a pledged contract? Or is that a pledged covenant? Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Will you? Jesus is saying, you're not going to be able to keep that pledge. No matter how well-meaning it was, you can't. If it was a contract, it's broken. Jesus goes on to say, truly I say to you, the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. Would you quickly go now to John 14, 15? John 14, 15. Quickly, please. In these verses, I want you to count the number of times Jesus pledges a promise by saying something like, I will. So if it's your Bible, go ahead and circle every time it says, I will. Chapter 14, verse 15. Jesus says to his disciples, so he's talking to all of us here today, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Now hold it there for a second. If you love me, you will keep my commands. Can we keep our commands, the commandments, very well? <laughs> no, we don't. So in order to be saved, we can't do it by following the Ten Commandments. We're going to have to be saved by Jesus. He says, I did not come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill it. You can't. You can't do them, but I can, says Jesus. So in a sense, because Jesus makes the first move, because Jesus loves us first, because Jesus resurrected for us, now we can respond. So go ahead, give that a circle. Then verse 16, it gets really serious. Now Jesus says, I, he's taking the wheel. I will ask the Father, and he, the Father, will give you another helper to be with you forever. This helper forever is the Holy Spirit of God. Verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to be with you. Then in verse 19, he says, Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. The world will. Uh-oh, should we circle that? What does the world pledge itself to? The world. Yeah? And is the world going to save you? If you listen to a lot of people, this is how you get saved. This is how you have a great life. Do this, this, and this, and this. And it never quite seems to work out well for people. They're making a lot of money. They got a great car, a beautiful home. They've got cancer. So the world can't pledge you anything of any lasting power. But Jesus says, but you will see me. The world can't see me, but you will see me. So go ahead and circle that because even though it says you will, it's because you can see me because the Holy Spirit has come to you. And because I live, you also will live. <laughs> Jesus died for me, I live for him. Let's say that again as we declare. Jesus died for me, I live for him. Let's say it like we mean it. Jesus died for me, and I live for him. So how many wills did you circle? Huh? I circled seven which happens to be the biblical number for wholeness, for perfection. Because pledge after pledge as declared in John 14, I will for you, for you, for you, for you. It's God's beating heart for you. It is God's covenant life pledge. Come on, church, isn't that good news? Yeah, thanks. Let's go now to John 18, 25. 18, 25. And again, here's the setup. Jesus has been tried wrongly, convicted, 
flogged. In other words, he's had, you know, stones just ripping into his flesh, blood flying everywhere. He's been nailed to the cross, or he's about to be nailed to the cross. And at this moment, it's chaos. I don't know, look in the streets of America and you'll see the same thing. People are yelling things, and, you know, all sorts of stuff. Slanderous, truth, we don't know. They're chaotic, they're angry, they're, they're about ready to, to uh, be in a violent mob. It's not an easy time for someone to stand up and say, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus. I mean, right then and there you might get swept away by the world and crucified yourself. So we pick it up in John 18, 25. It says, Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, this mad crowd, Hey, you also are not one of his disciples, aren't you? And Peter denied it. No, 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 I am not. Then one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off a few hours earlier, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him, that Jesus guy? And again, Peter denied it. And at once the rooster crowed. <laughs> if this was a contract between Peter and Jesus, it was just brutally broken by Peter. And if his salvation was on the line, deal off. Remember, just hours earlier, Peter had pledged that he would never, never, never leave Jesus. Let's stop making contracts with God, friends. They don't work. You know what does work? Our worship band. Would you please rise up, please, guys? One last time, let's go to John 21. John chapter 21, verse 15. Here's the setup. Now Jesus has been crucified at the cross. He's, he's dead. He's buried. But then you know what happens on that resurrection day, that third day? He pushes back the stone. He says, darkness and evil cannot conquer me, for I am who I say I am. I am the way and the truth and the life. And he breaks through in the light. And now he's making himself known to his disciples again. John 21, 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter said to Jesus, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, what does your Bible say? Feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. That's, that's to be our response of faith. Jesus has pledged himself to the point of death and now new life. And he's calling Peter and everybody else to pledge ourselves back to Jesus. Verse 16. Again, Jesus asked the same pointed question. Peter, do you love me? Or CLC, do you love me? Yes, Lord, we love you. Then Jesus says, well, then feed my sheep. This is to be our response of saying we believe God. Verse 17, again, a third time. Same question from Jesus. And Peter said, Lord, I do love you. And Jesus says, then feed my sheep. What has Jesus just done there the third time? He has canceled, canceled Peter's broken contract by reinstating a new covenant pledge to Peter and with all mankind. It is a redo, a new beginning, a new life, a born-again experience. Yay. Jesus is saying, believe me. Not just in me, but believe me. Trust me. Follow me. Obey me. That is to be our response, our pledge of allegiance back to God. Our founding father, I'm not talking about the early Americans. Our founding father, the Lord Jesus himself, penned these biblical pledges that we just read through this morning because he wants us to hear how he declares his love over us, that he's unconditional, that he is unrelentless in looking to save us, kind of like Mark's story, unrelentlessly going after Mark. So friends, what might that look like for you today? Are you in need of a redo? <laughs> yeah, I think so, huh? A new start, something you said a day ago, an hour ago, a second ago that's not of God or thought, and we're all there. How about if we rise up now again? Rise up. Let's take this important moment right here to go straight to the Lord 
and confess all those contracts that we make with God and with other people every day that we end up breaking. And let's take this moment of silence asking God for his covenant forgiveness. Let's do that. invite everyone to once again place your hand on your heart still beating of course it is and even if your heart wasn't beating God's heart for you is always will be and so now here I want you to just listen here Jesus's pledge by making this declaration over you right now Jesus says I died for you, Christ Lutheran Church. You are mine, and nothing can change that. You may turn your back on me, but I will never turn my back on you. I forgive you of your sin. By my blood at the cross, you are free. So go now and live as if you believe that's true. Remember, my friends, I died for you. You are now invited by faith to live for me. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Go right. Yes. That's a response. Don't hold back responses. Let us pray, shall we? Lord God, we begin by simply thanking you for your love making the very first move towards us by first pledging yourself to us so that we can respond with a pledge of faithfulness back to you. Empower us, Lord, to continue to grow in the kind of faith that it takes to believe you in all things through all circumstances, good, bad, ugly, pleasant. We pray this day for our nation torn in two by evil intentions. Forgive us for even thinking for a moment that elected politicians or rules or regulations can save us or even bring lasting peace. Instead, replace anger with anticipation that you and only you, through Jesus, can bring the hope and the peace the world longs for. We pray this day for those who are sick or tired or sick and tired. For those who are mourning or misled, let them hear your word of I will, I will, I will ring in their ears so their hearts can, can beat to the rhythm of your perspective and your pledges. Today we specifically pray for Jim Baranek and his healing from back surgery as well as countless family and friends and acquaintances facing COVID and its problems. And Lord, we pray for Pastor Paul Ogle as he begins his new tour as CLC's interim associate pastor. Likewise, we pray for our council as it retreats next weekend, seeking your direction for the future. Because all of this and so much more, we pray in the name and in the authority of Jesus and living into his glorious day. His glorious day. And all God's people said what? Amen to that. Amen to that. What a promise and a pledge that is. Yes. Let's sing, shall we? Glorious day. Yes, it is. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing I'm
with the mission and the ministry of Christ Lutheran Church. On Sunday, January 24th, we'll be having a, a light lunch and orientation. Come and find out what that is. You don't have to join. You can just simply come and find out what the, what's going on in the vision. Or maybe you've been a long-term member and you say, I'm going to be re-fueled with how the Spirit of God is leading us in our congregation. So sign up by calling the church office. Details are in your bulletin. Receive this pledge. Remember, dear friends, remember and never forget God's pledge. Nothing, nothing, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate you from my love in Christ Jesus. And all God's people said, praise be to God, praise be to God. What a glorious day, huh? What a glorious day. Uh, next week, promises of God. Don't miss that. God bless your day, everyone. God bless your week. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I Songs of the Lord.